Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! On Monday, Hillary Benn made Labour's case for Britain to stay in the European Union. Later this week and next, I'll be speaking to leading campaigners on the Leave side of the debate. But tonight, I'm joined by the Chancellor, George Osborne. He's part of a Conservative government that's given us this referendum and is now campaigning hard for the UK to remain in the EU. Welcome to the programme, Chancellor. It's good to be here. Now, you claim the European Union could cause armed conflict if we leave. Uh, you could put a bomb under our economy if we leave, the Prime Minister's words, hurt pensioners, collapse house prices. Why are you risking all that with a referendum? Look, I don't think it's ever a risk in a democracy to ask the people. And all my lifetime, this issue of Britain's membership of the European Union has hung over our economy and our security, and I think it's right that the people decide. You know, I think Britain can be one of the great success stories of the 21st century. We've got the talent, the drive, the connections around the world. But if we vote to leave, then we lose control. We lose control of our economy, and if you lose control of your economy, you lose control of everything. And that's not a price worth paying. Before you called this referendum, did you ever think that the consequences of losing then would be, by your own standards, so bad? Well, I knew it was a big decision, as of course did the Prime Minister, but it was also a decision of the British people, Andrew. We put this in the manifesto upon sure. which we were elected. And I think people should be under no illusions. I doubt there's going to be a bigger decision that we're going to be asked to take as citizens of this country, and all of us, you, me, people watching at home, we all have one vote, so let's use it. Now, despite everything you're saying about what would happen if we leave, only a few months ago, the Prime Minister assured us we'd be OK outside the European Union if we left. This is what he told the CVI. Today, I also want to debunk an argument that's sometimes put around by those who say, stay in Europe, come what may. Some people seem to say that really Britain couldn't survive, couldn't do OK outside the European Union. I don't think that is true. So, last November, we'd be OK if we left the European Union. Now it's plague and pestilence, Sodom and Gomorrah. What's changed? Well, OK is not good enough for Britain. Losing control of your economy is not good enough for Britain. I want Britain to be out there shaping the world, not but, shaped by But it. you're not just saying now if we left we'd be OK. You're saying it would bomb our economy. You would say, well, you've said it would be an extraordinary piece of self-harm. And yet, a few months ago, we're told it would be OK. Well, it's, what, what the Prime Minister is saying is that we could survive outside the EU. The question is, well, where said do we we'd thrive? be OK. Yeah, but OK is not good enough for one of the great success stories, potentially, of the 21st century. You know, I don't want to be sitting here as the Chancellor who has helped with the British people pull us out of the mess we were in six or seven years ago, climbed up those ladders on the snakes and ladder board and find ourselves hitting the big snake that takes us down to the bottom. That's what's at stake. And, you know, it's not abstract. This is about people's jobs, mm. their livelihoods, their ability to provide for their family. That is on the ballot paper Indeed. on the 23rd of June. Well, let's look in more detail at some of your scarier predictions if we leave. You claim house prices would plummet. Now, why would they plummet when even the Treasury is only forecasting, and it may be wrong, a very shallow recession if we were to leave? Well, because the country is poorer, People in the country have lower incomes than they would otherwise have. And as a result, their ability to afford homes is reduced, so the value of homes is less. And, as we've heard from the Governor of the Bank of England, mortgage rates might be higher. Well, so I the ability to, to afford to, to that. mortgages is also constrained. We, you know, it's we interesting, we, we estimated in the Treasury, the Treasury economists, the house prices would be 10 to 18% lower than they would otherwise be. And do you know what? Fitch, the rating agency, respected around the world, they said actually it could be 25%. So there are various that's, estimates out there, but I'll tell that, you what... That, that's the ratings agency, Andrew, Chancellor, Andrew. that said all the toxic death on the Royal Bank of Scotland's bank sheet should be rated treble A. Why would you listen to that? Because if you listen to everyone, whether it's all the economists yeah. out there, the big international organisations, the companies, large and small, the trade union movement, the leaderships of the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, the Scottish Nationalists, the Ulster Unionists. You listen to everyone and they're telling you that Britain will be poorer, 
The families in Burundi will be poorer. And you, look, we can talk about any number of numbers. I'll tell you what they've all got in common. One big fat minus in front of each one of but, them. That's the consequence for the people watching this program. But I'm puzzled that since the central forecast of the Treasury is for a shallow recession, now nobody wants a recession at all, mm. but the central forecast is for a shallow recession, if we were to believe. So shallow, it's actually within a Treasury uh, margin of error. But the fallen house price is so high. I mean, curiously precise, 18%. You say, you don't really know that, unless you're not just the Chancellor, you're Mystic Meg. Well, hold on, your 18% that you quoted, that's the Treasury's forecast if there is a severe shock, and that is not a shallow recession. Right? That is if the financial market turbulence, which we're likely to see in the hours and days after a vote to leave, is uh, compounded by uncertainty over the next few years yep. as we fail to find a suitable arrangement with our closest trading partners. And then this is the crucial point. Unlike actually the very deep recession we had seven or eight years ago, people would know, businesses would know, investors would know that the country is permanently poorer. So the value of the assets in the country, the houses, the pensions, the shares, mm -hmm. they all fall to take accommodation for that. You mentioned mortgage payments, and again, on your scenario, you say they could rise by maybe over a thousand pounds on average. I saw one figure in your report, 1,200. But if the shock of the economy was as bad as you think, the Bank of England would move to ease credit. It would pump more money into the economy. Why would mortgage payments rise so much? Well, it's very important that people understand this. I mean, first of all, the Bank of England, not just Mark Carney, although he is, of course, completely independent and respected around the world, but all the members of the Monetary Policy Committee, and they're all independent of me and of the government, they say this. First of all, you can't take it for granted that the Bank of England would cut interest rates because they would be dealing with higher inflation as well. And so they would have a real challenge. Do you try and boost the economy or do you try and control inflation? And then second, you know, the actual mortgage price that you pay or someone watching this program pays when they go into a building society or a bank, that is driven by the cost of credit out there in the economy. And that becomes more expensive when the economy is poorer and people are defaulting on their mortgage but payments. But it's expensive people are losing over £1,000. You don't know that again. Well, that, You've chosen the worst possible figures to try uh, to scare people. Uh, that is actually not the case. The Treasury forecasts for all of these things are not at the extreme end. And what we're saying is that mortgage rates could rise between 70 and about 130 basis points, about 1% on the cost of mortgages. But for the average mortgage, that's over almost a thousand pounds. You know, that means a lot to people out there working hard, working hard today, getting home, watching this program. You know, that all gets wiped out. That's the You've real got... cost if we, if we lose control of our economy. People know this, they've lived through this. In recent right. history, let's not go there again. You've been scaring pensioners too, haven't you? You've claimed that uh, the Remain campaigns claimed there could be £32,000 worth of pensioners. Here's the official tweet designed to frighten the older folks. There we see it there with the, the purse. Let's just look at this. State pensions are protected by your own triple lock. Whether we're in or out of the EU, pensions in real terms wouldn't fall. Well, f first of all, you keep saying... You're attempting to scare the population. You've said it twice now. Frankly, there is a lot to be scared about if we leave the European Union and we risk our economy. And okay. it's, and, so and it's a risk to here? pensioners, it's a risk to homeowners, it's a risk to people in work. So the state pension, right. it's, so, it, it wouldn't well, be the, falling the in real terms. The state pension, because we had a successful, strong, growing economy, which we don't want to put at risk, rises by the so-called triple lock, either by the rate of inflation or by mm. the rate of earnings or by 2.5%. Right. Well, if the rate of inflation is higher, and people are forecasting it, it could be 3 to 4%, the rate of inflation, instead of what it is today. Well, that will eat away at the real value of people's pension. Put that in plain English. Pensioners but, will have less to spend. Their, their the money won't lock go involves as involves pensions are rising by the rate of inflation, then, if that's the highest but the real, of the three triple locks. Yes, and the real increase, so, therefore, is reduced. This matters to me. Andrew, you know, we're talking about numbers. This is the ability of a pensioner to go out there this... and you know, provide for themselves and support themselves, and, the, and their ability of their pension goes less far the... when there is higher inflation. The, the pensioners is, know that. The in or out, the state pension would rise at least in line with inflation. That's your lock. Showing that empty purse there, empty. You should be ashamed of that, shouldn't you? Well, absolutely not. It's vital that people realise what is at stake here. 
You know, well, the, 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 the purse lot... will be empty. Well, I tell you what's at stake. The prosperity of the British economy. We would have a recession. People's incomes would be hit. Their ability to provide for their families would be hit. We've not even talked about unemployment. You know, Andrew, this all feels very abstract, right? I brought along... It's not abstract no, at I'm all. I'm, I'm showing the patient example, right? Yes. I brought along this because I went to a factory in Keithley in West Yorkshire. This is a part of an Airbus plane. And it's made by a real person on a real production line. And he worries about his job. And his company worries about their ability to access the single market. Right? This we, is not we, abstract. We make, the wings, the we make the wings for Airbus, right? We don't know whether, no, no, that, whether, we we make don't the know whether we're going to go on being able to Who, sell this. Where would Airbus go to buy the wings? If not Britain. Well, there's no reason why. And the, by the in, way, in or out the by, EU. By the way, the chief executive of Airbus Who else makes has these wings? themselves. The chief executive of Airbus has themselves what? said it would threaten their investment in the United Kingdom. And the point about this: this isn't an Airbus the, factory. This is a small manufacturing sure, business but in West Yorkshire. For the this wings. is the this reality is of the single market. This is another scarce story. This is not. Story, this is the reality of the single market. Airbus would come to Britain to buy its wings and its Rolls-Royce engines, whether we are in or out of the EU. That is not what the chief executive says. The chief executive says that investment so in the UK... So where would they go? Well, they could, they've got factories in Toulouse, they've got factories in they Germany. They don't make wings. The whole point they of, don't make wings well, whole, in Germany. Well, the whole point about Airbus is it's an integrated supply chain. We import things from Germany, we sell them to France. And if there are tariffs, a tax on those exports, then why would the business happen in the UK? Oh. We'd be out of the single market. That's the, the reality. Britain would be quitting, the, quitting the single market quitting the prosperity, quitting the source All of right. jobs. The and Treasury... The, real, the people who pay the price are not you or me, Andrew. It's that person working well, on the assembly the, line in what, Keithley. What people watching this programme want to know is if what you're telling is a scare story or true. Now, you've prepared a longer-term report as well about leaving. The key finding that you were very keen to promote is that by 2030, households would be £4,300 worth off. Here's the poster. You even stood in front of the poster there. There's your figure. But the Treasury report doesn't say families would be £4,300 worse off, does it? It's a bogus and misleading figure. Well, that's not the case. That is, how much per household our GDP would shrink. And if you look at... Well, no, no, it's not shrinking. Or on either scenario, well, in or out, the Treasury report showed substantial well, growth in our economy to the, 2030. The, the, the question on the 20... What, not shrinking? Uh, hold on, Andrew. The question on the 23rd of June is what does the world look like if we're in the European Union or if we leave the European Union and quit it, right? And families would be £4,300 a year worse off... No, they wouldn't. As a proportion... Their income. As a share of their GDP. Well, but it the, doesn't mention their income. Their incomes would be hit and... Well, and, hold on, the wealth of the nation that provides the public services they depend on. You know, leave that picture up because well, people need I to know. I will leave it up. Right, leave it up because people no, need no, to know Chancellor, what is I will leave it up for real people. Do know that because I'm going to put what the Treasury Select Committee said about your £4,300 under that picture. This is not what the main Treasury analysis found, says the Select Committee. The average impact on household disposable incomes would be considerably smaller than this number. Neither government departments nor the Remain side should repeat this mistaken assertion. To persist with this claim would be to misrepresent the Treasury's own work. Why are you misrepresenting your own department? Well, if you actually read the full paragraph in that report, it says the Treasury accurately presented the numbers and that it's perfectly but, legitimate to talk about the impact on households yeah, as a proportion told you not of not to GDP. repeat this figure. No, it says don't repeat it. It would be to misrepresent not, your own I'm sorry, you're work. selectively quoting from that report. Not at all. That's you're, what the well, Treasury are. Committee says. Well, you're selectively quoting from that report. It well, the thinks report, your well, the report, £4,300 Andrew, pound figure is bogus. Andrew, A, you're selectively quoting from that report. The report said, and I read it, of course, that, uh, first of all, the Treasury had accurately presented those figures. Second, it's absolutely right that people in this country understand it's not just their incomes, but the value of the public services they receive. All right. And, by the way, this is exactly the sort of number we've had from a whole host of international organisations. And just this week, well, just this week, you've had well, the... Well, no other organisation uh, uses that figure. Uh, well, they do, the OECD. No, it hasn't. It hasn't yes, it, used um, 4,000. Well, I'm sorry, the OE OECD uses GDP per household and comes up with a very similar number ah, to that. No, very similar. Let me move <laughs> on to immigration. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, listen, can I say all these things? It's like running a marathon. You don't know exactly how many minutes it's right. going to take, but if you shoot yourself in the foot, it's going to take a heck of a lot longer. Right. Treasury forecast does reveal one thing, though, doesn't it? It reveals that 
Your promise, your government's promise to reduce net migration to 100,000 a year, it's over, isn't it? You're not even trying to do that now. Well, I think it is achievable. It's an ambition we set out in the manifesto. Well, except that your forecasts for the 4,300 and everything else by 2030, they assume net migration of another 3 million over the next 14 years. That's an average of 214,000 a year, twice the promise you made way back in 2010 and repeated in your 2015 manifesto. Well, first of all, what those numbers show, what the Office for National Statistics show, and of course, independent of government, not taking into account, by the way, the most recent controls we've had on non-EU migration or the welfare uh, restrictions, which we have no doubt come on, on and talk about. But what it shows is net migration falling from 320 odd thousand this year to 180 odd thousand over five years. Now and that stays is, there for the whole of the next well, decade. I think the crucial thing to managing migration is first of all not to lose control of your economy but to a make sure you're restricting non-EU migration which is over half of the <laughs> migration we get second as you're doing this to make sure you don't have the abuse of the free movement yeah. of people but, and we've got that but crucially this third point Andrew can I make this third point you know what you've got to make sure is that we have a growing British economy and a growing European economy and the good news is that the European economy is growing now. We've had an exceptional right. two or three years That's where fine, Britain's been doing well and Europe has not been doing in, as well. In, but actually, look at the most recent but, GDP data. No, no, well, I know and, all and that. The I'm more concerned about better. your promise. You promised in 2010 to cut net migration to 100,000. By 2030, 20 years later, you're still assuming it will be twice that amount. It'll still, a, a number of people, the size of the population of Newcastle will be coming in. It's a broken promise it's over no, it's an ambition we intend was to it be an ambition now yeah, but that's what it was in our no manifesto. it wasn't it was a promise no, no. ifs no buts no. the prime minister said Andrew in the manifesto that the country voted on last year we set it out as an ambition I believe it's an ambition we will achieve if we manage migration by a dealing with the non-European migration B dealing with the abuse of free movement and people coming here and taking out before they put in well let's come and see as both economies grow the European economy the British economy you don't have this exceptional situation you've had for the last couple of years where you've had very weak economies on the continent of Europe thankfully they're now growing that's by the way a good it's thing for Britain because we export to these economies and they're crucial to our economic you still future. expect almost 200,000 to come in by 2030 but there was a time when David Cameron said he'd get a grip on immigration by ending free movement from the EU this is what he told the Tory conference in 2014 it will be at the very heart of my renegotiation strategy for Europe. Britain, I know you want this sorted, so I will go to Brussels, I will not take no for an answer, and when it comes to free movement, I will get what Britain needs. I will not take no for an answer. And in a sense, he didn't, because in the end, he didn't even ask for any serious limits on free movement, he bottled it. Uh, the Prime Minister got a good deal for Britain, an excellent deal. That, by, the way, no the by the way, no previous Prime Minister has got, which is that you cannot come to this country and get out before you put in. That is a key well, change that addresses, actually, I think, the big public concern that people he have about free movement of people. He didn't get any fundamental change to free movement, did he? Can we agree that? Well, yes, he did, actually, a fundamental change, which is you can't just come here and well, claim welfare. Well, you say that because, because he got nothing on free movement of substance. His fallback then was to say that EU citizens couldn't just come here looking for work. They had to have a job. That's what he promised. Yeah. And he bottled that, too, because that's not the case. Well, that's, I'm afraid it is the case. That you can I, come here without a job. Well, you have to look for a job. If you don't have a yeah. job within six months, you do, by the way, you don't get any unemployment benefit or housing benefit well, or the well, like. Come on. And then... You do get unemployment benefit. You get it after three months. You don't get it when you arrive. And you you get to. it after three months. And then if you don't have a job after six months, you have to go. But you do get it for part of the well, time. You, you used to get it when you arrive. And it could arrive. be extended. Andrew, you used to get it you when you You said arrive. you don't get any unemployment well, benefit. True. You simply tell you get it after well, three months. When you arrive, you used to get it, you don't anymore. But look, but he, you know, but, can, I, can I make but, a point? But he did here? once say to, say to us that you wouldn't be able to come here unless you had a job, and that's not true. You, you can. You 77,000 people remember. last year came as job seekers from the EU. They didn't have a job. But Andrew, if you don't have a job, you have to go. Well, you say that because the next fallback was... If EU job seekers couldn't find a job, they'd have to leave. This is what he said on ITV last night. He said, one of my key demands which I got was, if you come here, 
you don't get unemployment benefit, we know that's not actually true, and if you haven't got a job after six months, you have to leave. How many failed EU job seekers have been required to leave after six months? Well, 6,000 people so far have been removed for abuse of the freedom of movement. But that's not all job seekers. But it's people who are abusing the free movement of people. But I, what I asked you was, how many, well, give e you the answer, 6, how many EU job seekers have been required to leave after six months? Well, it's 6,000. But can I make but a... they're not all... They're, they're, these well, are they're, many well, people I'm sorry, Andrew, they that are. have been removed. They're, they're, they're people specifically abusing free movement. But I'm, I'm not, not talking about... about... No, I'm not talking about people with criminal records who are turned away at the border because we have border controls, as anyone who goes through passport control knows full well. I'm talking about people who are abusing free movement of people, but they now get removed. And look, the question on are the ballot paper... Are you saying that all 6,000 were simply job seekers who didn't have a job no, uh, who, at who the were, end of six months? Who were abusing the free... Yeah, which includes not having ah, a job. Ah, includes. But, yes, but... So but what of... part of the 6,000 you claim were actual job seekers? But they were all job seekers who were here to claim work and they've had to leave. But look, Andrew, can I make a bigger point here? Because well, this we is can... quite a big well, point because I'll make, you promised I'll, it. I will make a, a bigger point still, which is, you know, first of all, what's this referendum about? Whether we're in the EU or not. Mm. I do not believe that there is some fantasy world out there that if we leave the EU, we can somehow have greater control and management of our immigration. I think we'd end up signing up to free movement of people, but having no say over how it operated. We would lose the cooperation of some of our closest allies mm. on key things like border control. It would be much more difficult, for example, in Northern Ireland to maintain border control there. You also have a situation, if we leave the European Union, that we would be there begging to be back into the single market, prepared to pay almost any price to support the businesses that I've identified. If all this I do not believe, I do not believe this claim. And it's interesting, when pressed, the Leave campaigners have basically admitted their policy would see more immigration from if, outside the if EU. All that this is, immigration so is be, so people good. should be clear. Look, they you, might have concerns about immigration, but if, that is not on the ballot paper. If you wanted to our talk, membership of the European if Union you wanted and to talk all about the prosperity the and our role in the world, that's on the ballot paper. If you paper. wanted to talk about the Leave campaign, Chancellor, you should have agreed to debate them. I'm here to talk about the case for Remain and to test it. I'm debating and if all you. this I'm immigration, you. come on, let's have a debate. If all this immigration, I was just in Parliament If all this immigration is so good for the pub, for, for the economy, why do you want to cut it? Well, it's important that it's managed. Right? It's important that people come here and contribute to our economy. We've got vacancies in our economy. What I want to do above all is make sure the British people uh, have the skills, uh, the ability right. to get those jobs. We're in a great situation in our country where there are actually more vacancies than there are people claiming job seekers allowed. The flow. And I want to go on building that strong economy. You know, I don't want to lose control of the economy. There's still 1.7 million people who can't find a job. But I want to come on to this migrants thing as well, that it could be even higher if Turkey was to join the EU. And Mr Cameron's been a big supporter of Turkey joining the EU. This is what he looks when he, he went to Ankara not long after he'd become PM, the capital of Turkey, in 2010. This is what he had to say. When I think about what Turkey has done to defend Europe as a NATO ally, and what Turkey is doing today in Afghanistan alongside our European allies, it makes me angry that your progress towards EU membership can be frustrated in the way that it has been. My view is clear. I believe it's just wrong to say that Turkey can guard the camp but not be allowed to sit in the tent. So I will remain your strongest possible advocate for EU membership and for greater influence at the top table of European diplomacy. That was six years ago. Now the Prime Minister says that Turkey may not join for almost a thousand years, he says. Now, who is he misleading? Was he misleading the Turkish people in 2010, or is he misleading the British people in 2016? Well, do you know, I was 16 years old when Turkey first applied to join the European Union. I'm now 45, and I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, because sadly, actually, over recent years, Turkey has gone backwards. There are concerns about democracy and human rights there. These are all conditions you need to meet before you even are considered for membership of the European Union. Now, Turkey is a key ally. They're a member of NATO, by the way, an organisation we all, on all sides of the yep. campaign, talk up. But is it going to be a member of the European Union? No, it's not. Well, if that's true, why... If the prospect is so far away, in your lifetime, you say, why has the Prime Minister supported an agreement in March to re-energise Turkey's succession process? And indeed, we have committed a billion pounds of taxpayers' money 
to speed the Turkish process up. Okay. Why, why would you do that well, if you well, don't believe it? Well, because everyone can see from their television screens that Turkey is vital to our security as a continent. Look at it. Borders on Syria. So, it's absolutely key member of so, NATO. So you so are speeding up no, no, the accession no, no, process. No, no, no. We want it. Of course, to reform, we want its economy to improve, but it is not going to be a member of the European Union. And can I make is this, it still the British? Uh, there are a lot of referendums you, you, for are, a long time. Andrew, this Andrew, referendum Andrew, could be for longer than your life. Uh, uh, is it the case? Is it still British government policy that Turkey should become a member of the EU? It is not, it, the British government policy is it should not join the European Union today. Right? Today, and it's, right. well, and it's, and and it's a million miles away from joining. It's a million miles away. So it's, what happened no, no, to the, on, Andrew, Andrew, what happened uh, Andrew, to the Prime listen, Minister being the strongest possible advocate then of Andrew, joining? That, well, that, unfortunately, Turkey has taken backward steps. But look, I make a broader point. There are a lot of scare stories. You asked about scare stories. A lot of scare stories about that. Disgusting things said about bodies of migrants being washed up on the floors, uh, on the shores of Kent, or about women being raped by migrants. You know. Let's be clear, this is a battle for the soul of our country. I do not want Nigel Farage's vision of Britain. It is mean, it is divisive, it is not who we are as a country. Well, Britain is a great country that is open and inclusive, and it is a country that shapes the world, not is shaped let, by the world. Let me go and one... that is what we're fighting for. I understand we're fighting that. for the soul of this country. Well, but, and you know the, But we're also sadly, fighting for truth. Sadly, Nigel Farage and his vision of Britain has taken over the Leave campaign. Well, and, and we are fighting against that. I, I want understand the mainstream that. of the majority line, of this country. I've got one more question for you. To stand up and say we right. do not want right. Nigel Farage's vision I've got of one country. more question for you. A lot of people will think you've exaggerated the claims about the economic impact of Brexit. You promised the British people restrictions on immigration. You haven't delivered. That's clear. The Prime Minister has told Turkey he wants it to become an EU member. He's passionate for the case. Then he told the British people the opposite. Why exactly? Should the British people trust you when you say vote to remain? Because it's very simple. If we vote to remain, then Britain will be stronger, better off, safer as a country. But if we leave, then we will lose control of our economy. That means losing control of everything. You know, I'm a father of two children, and I don't want to look around to them in 20 years' time and say, you know, Britain used to be a great success, used to be connected to the world, but we took a decision and we retreated from us from this world, that used to be us. I don't want to say that to my children. I want Britain to be the great success story of the 21st century. Chancellor, thank you. I've been